string topology. So let me start with uh, saying what kind of uh, questions in string topology I want to address, and then I, I actually switch uh, the point of view and first talk about something. Others And uh, mostly let me spell out what version of string topology I want to talk about. Uh, um, so throughout this talk, M will be an n-dimensional closed semi-oriented, although that's not really necessary, manifold. And I will denote by lambda, or sometimes maybe I write lambda of M, the free loop space with just the smooth maps from the circle into M. And what will also play a role is the space of constant loops, which I will denote by lambda zero, which is just the constant loop loops. And, and the free topology Uh, refers to uh, a whole wealth of uh, operations, products and co-product structures, higher operations on the homology of loop spaces, and also on the equivariant homology. There's a natural as one action here. Uh, so today I will talk about the non-equivariant homology. So it will, in, in the previous talk, there was a mention of the goldman turayev uh, algebra structure on a surface, that's the equivariant case. So, so I will talk about the non-equivalent case. So string topology as defined by Chas and Sullivan, 99, um, gives us operations on the homology of, of the free loop space. And I will mostly be interested in two operations. The first one is, uh, let me go. Is a product and the second one the co product. So the first one I will call the loop product. I will sometimes denote a product by mu, sometimes I will write a dot for it. So this is on the homology of lambda. I will be sloppy about coefficients, assume uh, real coefficients to be on the safe side. A lot of things are true with integer coefficients or with other coefficients, also with twisted coefficients. But I don't want to bother with that so much. So, uh, so there's a loop product uh, of degree minus n. And uh, uh, the picture for the loop product is uh, you want to you, you take two uh, class, two, two homology class on the loop space, you represent them by some chains on loop spaces. I'm thinking of them as some families of loops varying. So I have two such families. One family is A, one family is B, representing some cycles in the loop space. Then the, the loops are parameterized. So, they, so we have some, some time zero here, and we have a time zero also on these loops. The loops are not embedded here, but I am just drawing them schematically. And, uh, and then the, the loop product is given by restricting to the locus where the evaluations at time zero coincide and where the evaluations at time zero coincide, you can concatenate it around this loop at, at twice the speed and then around that loop and you get a new loop and you get a chain of new loops in the cycle and that gives you the new class. So that is the picture of new loops. Yeah, of course you can say it in much more fancy way with, with, with Tom that uh, uh, this would be good enough for this. And then there's a loop co-product also. It has degree minus n because we have a co-dimension n uh, incidence. So loop co-product, uh, which I will denote by lambda, on also on the homology, 
but relative to the constant loops, it has degree one minus n, and it's schematically defined as follows. Now I'm just taking one chain of loops, and I take evaluation at time zero, and I take evaluation at some other time t, which can vary freely, and then I'm looking at the locus where those two evaluations at time zero and at time t coincide, i.e. when the loop has a self-intersection at time t, it intersects its value at time zero. And then I can decompose. I can decompose it into two loops, going from zero to t and from t to one. And, uh, and that way I can view it as a chain in the product of, of lambda with itself. And then by unit form, I get something into the time product. I get a co-product. Yeah, so that's a picture of lambda of A. And uh, what will also play a role if you don't like thinking about co-products, uh, you can, of course, instead think about it as a product on cohomology, right? So, so this is dual to a product. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, let me not give the name. Maybe it's called the cohomology product. I will denote by this. I was a circle on cohomology. The constant. Why relative constant loops? Because you have a problem when t goes to zero or to one here. Then, then this is uh, becoming degenerate because you always have an, have a self intersection when t is equal to zero, and you have a self intersection when t is equal to one. So this is not transversely cut out. You need to do something about it. And the easiest way to deal with it is where you say, okay, if, if t is equal to zero, I decompose it into a constant loop going from zero to zero and, and end the, the rest. So if I just mod out all the constant loops, then I'm good. I don't care what's happening. So, so this, is, this is the easiest way to make it well-defined to, to mod out. Is there also a framing way to get rid of it? To... Uh, yeah, there is. I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah, you, you, can, you can lift it by modding out less than all the constant loops. And I'll come to it. Okay, so so now I, I want to mention two puzzles in that arose in this context. And the first one is so we have a product and a co-product. You want to think of them as, as giving some structure together, but but there's a lot of questions about that. First of all, they are defined on different spaces. So this comes to your question. Can we put them on the same space? Yeah. And we put mu and lambda on the same space. And uh, and start thinking about it, it's, it's, it's not, not completely obvious because then you, you cannot just lift lambda by not modding out anything and you can you cannot descend mu to this one. And so, so, but uh, we we'll come to that. And if, if we can, and uh, I'll show you we can, then what kind of relation satisfy? Do they satisfy? What? What algebra would they define? And uh, what, what algebraic structure do they define? Um, there's also other questions. For instance, why why are the degrees off by one? This has degree minus n. This has degree one minus n. So the so degrees are off by one. This suggests that this loop coproduct might be wants to be maybe something like a secondary co-product derived from the vanishing of a primary co-product, which uh, it also turns out to be the case. It's lambda a secondary. Yeah, and also this funny degree shift will also be explained in the course of uh, in this, uh, this puzzle. For example, there, there has been one particular relation suggested by Dennis Sullivan that should be satisfied. and. Uh, it took us a long time to get over it because we always try to prove that relation until we realize it's just not true. Then I'll show you how, what the correct version of that relation is once we put everything into the same uh, framework. Then uh, the second puzzle, that's uh, really when <laughs> she, together with Marco Reski, I should mention their names here also. They intensively studied this uh, product, this product on cohomology, and uh, proved many of its properties. And then 
uh, derived applications of this to the study of closed geodesic, the existence of closed geodesic growth of the number of closed geodesics and the like. And what they found is that there's a lot of uh, results you can, you can prove about the loop product and about this cohomology product, which uh, look very similar. They look like they want to be dual results. So there's a lot of pairs of dual results. So of pairs of dual results about the product and the cohomology product. So I think Nancy once gave a talk, a short talk, and made a list of six or seven of such pairs of dual results. And you stare at them, and they all look very much like dual. For, for instance, you can define, for, uh, for example, let me give one example. For a homology class, you can define its critical value. The, the homology is filtered by the length of curves, and you can look what is the first, the smallest length of curve where this class appears. So the critical value, and then this satisfies the critical value of x, x y is less, less or equal to the critical value of x plus the critical value of y, where this is the this is the loop product, and then. If you take a, a cohomology class, well, the constants, then you can also define a critical value where that cohomology class lives the first time. So, sorry, what, what's the length of a curve? You have a, a metric on your. Yeah, so let's pick, let's pick a metric. You pick a, an arbitrary let's metric. Pick a metric. Yeah, this, this critical value depends on a choice of a metric. Yeah. Okay. But for, for every metric, yeah. every metric, uh, this is going to be true. What is this critical value? How is it defined? Sorry? How is it defined, this critical value? So, okay, so, so, so on homology, uh, the critical value of X is the interim over all real numbers A, such that uh, X lives in the homology of lambda of the space uh, of loops of length less than a, where length is defined with respect to some Riemannian metric. Yeah, and in cohomology, similarly, you do something with relative. Uh, yeah. uh, and then, if you define this critical value from cohomology, you can take their cohomology product, and you get this. Right? And the inequality sign is reversed. Yeah, so. This is, uh, I, I found this when, when Nancy told me about it, I found it really intriguing. Yeah? Like, what, what is going on, right? I mean, this cries for some explanation. It can't be an accident. Um, and uh, it, it, it wants to be somehow two sides of the same statement. Yeah. And, and there's this song of others. So, so question is, uh, can this be explained by some actual duality? And, and Nancy term, uh, termed it Poincaré duality, although it is probably not the we know in love, but because the data exists some concrete duality uh, relating these two products, interchanging those two products, so that the statement uh, about this product under concrete duality becomes a statement about this product. Yeah, you prove one, you have the other. That's that would be the goal. And, and we'll see that this is also okay. Now, now get, let me get to the main part of the talk. And uh, this can be entitled maybe as variations and a long exact sequence. So, so let me. We start with the simplest topological setting. So V of dimension M, let's say this is a compact manifold with boundary. Now, now there's been many claims during this conference of what the audience knows and does not know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think this is safe to claim that people know. Okay. I did agree with most of the other claims. <laughs> um, 
So you take a cohomology of the rel boundary and uh, you map it to cohomology of V, you map it to cohomology of the boundary, and then there's a connecting motion into cohomology of V uh, plus one of the rel boundary. And so, yeah. So I guess I, I have everything on the same boat here. Um, now also uh, there's a there's a duality here, namely this is Poincaré duality uh, with boundary. Uh, so it's h in degree m minus star of v. This is h in degree m minus star of v well boundary. This goes to h m minus star minus one well boundary. This goes h m minus star minus one of v and so on, and we have dualities everywhere here. V is orientable. V is orientable, yes. Again, otherwise you need to use different coefficients. Yes, thanks. Yeah. Orientable. Um, so, well, nothing much to say about this. We all know about this. Uh, let me let me denote this one by concrete duality because it's it's different from the other ones that in that it's really a self duality of the same space. I mean, this is relating two different spaces of the other ones, but this is really relating one space <laughs> to to its dual. Yeah. All right. Okay. That's fine. Now, the second one is uh, where this same logarithmic sequence comes up in symplectic geometry. Now, now. Um, <clears throat> Speaking about some things which some of you may not know, but I think you understand the structure of what's going on. Here. So let me at least say what the object is, the general object that should be entering here. It would be a manifold of dimension of E with 2n. And this could be a Liouville domain. Uh, which means it should be equipped with a one form lambda. So so lambda. Could be a one form such that uh, two properties hold. First of all, if you take D lambda, it's a two form, then that form should be symplectic. <coughs> it's already closed, so it should be non degenerate. Um, and if you restrict lambda to the boundary, so this is this is a manifold with boundary compact with boundary, the same way. Uh, if you restrict it to the boundary, you have a one form on an odd dimensional manifold, and the natural condition you could impose is that this is a contact form. <laughs> and it will not matter what those things mean for this talk, just to give at least the definition. Yeah. So it's a very particular nice type of symplectic manifold, which, which has uh, both a symplectic structure on the interior and a contact structure on the boundary, and you can interplay with those two structures. And now it turns out that to such a manifold, we can so we had a symplectic invariant called symplectic homology. So here, yeah. or maybe do it here. So I'll will define the symplectic homology as a direct limit of flow homologies. Direct limit over certain Hamiltonians. So I will not want to define what Fleur homology is. I will just draw a picture of what Hamiltonians we're using. So here's a here's a picture. So in this direction, I'm drawing the completion of this Liouville domain. So so here's maybe a picture of V. V is a manifold with boundary, and I'm gluing a, a half infinite collar to to its boundary. And you can do it in a nice way that's a symplectic, that this one form extends in a canonical way over this collar. So, so let me call this V hat. And now I, the Hamiltonian is a function on V hat. So I will just schematically draw V hat goes in this direction. So here's the boundary of V. So here's, here's the actual V, and then here's the, the half infinite collar. And we're using Hamiltonians, which have this shape that uh, the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is. Uh, is roughly zero here, it's slightly oscillating and then it's sloping up and it's linear. 
And uh, you do that, then we're looking for one, per one periodic orbit of such a Hamiltonian, and the one periodic orbit will show up in, in two places. There will be one periodic orbit showing up here. If we have the appropriate slope, then there will be one periodic orbit roughly sitting on the boundary. And then there will be some critical points here in the interior. You make it here and you perturb it by a small Morse function. So, so you find some critical points. So, so, so those will be the one periodic orbits. And flow homology is counting one periodic orbits in an appropriate way. It's, it's, the, it's a pre abelian group <laughs> generated by all the one periodic orbits. And then you define a differential, which is counting some perturbed pseudo holomorphic curve. And its homology is flow homology. But it's important to have an idea of what the generators look like. I think. And then, and then you take such Hamiltonians of some slope and you make them steeper and steeper. And as you let them go to infinity, you take a direct limit over this. There's, there's, there's canonical uh, morphisms between flow homologies as one Hamiltonian is smaller than the other. You get a map, and then you take a direct limit over that direct system. Okay. But in the in the limit just once, in the limit you get something which doesn't depend on any Hamiltonians anymore because you took a limit over all those Hamiltonians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll just to get an idea. What would be the answer for a symplectic ball? For a symplectic ball, you get zero. <laughs> And and I give you a next my main example where the answer is not zero and interesting. Yeah. So but for the black ball, you, the answer is zero. Now this is called a symplectic homology. And uh, it has a natural grading by condensate matrices, which I will not go into. Then you can define symplectic cohomology in two ways. Either you could just on the chain level, you just do a life on the chain level. You go to uh, homomorphisms to some ring on the chain level and to cohomology. There's also a more geometric way. Namely, I could take, Ham take Hamiltonians which are downward sloping. And uh, that would be, that would probably be the appropriate definition. That's what was our definition of symplectic homology of B rel its boundary, it's defined in the same way as a, as a limit over Hamiltonians. In fact, it's, it's an inverse limit in that case, but we're using Hamiltonians now, which, which are downwards. Thing. Then we, we let them go to minus infinity here, and, uh, and that's the definition of uh, rel boundary. And then also we can define symplectic homology of the boundary itself, and for that, we use yet another type of Hamiltonians. Namely, we use Hamiltonians like this, which are, which says they start very high up, they slope down, then they're roughly constant here, and then they go up again. Okay. Uh, so at some point we call those V-shaped Hamiltonians, although it looks more like a square root maybe then. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the generators are the following. You have some, some generators of positive slope here, which look like the generators here. You have some generators here of negative slope, which look like the generators here. And you have some also some constants here, but those are correspond to constants on the boundary, not in the interior. So, so this does not see the interior in a way. So, so there's also some generators here, but they fall out of some action window, which one picks this. So, so, so those actually don't, don't count. So it's really generated by things on the boundary, which is denoted as invariant of the boundary. Yeah. Okay. And, and now you can guess it. So, so now they, they fit into exactly the same long term. So let me write it also. Symplectic homology of P the boundary goes to symplectic homology of E, goes to symplectic homology of the boundary, goes to symplectic homology in degree one less. And then there's dualities to symplectic cohomology. Now the grading is such that here there's no shift, it just minus the minus the degree. <clears throat> yes. Uh, are the two sequences related? Yes. Is it potential? Yes. 
And uh, now uh, the long answer. Uh, first, maybe some other question which might have arisen is uh, it's kind of funny because this I write I write the top row as homology, the symplectic homology, and it behaves like cohomology. Uh, so so people hate me for that. You have to apologize. So so you're all free to listen for them. Um, I have my reasons, and uh, I'll come to that. Why why I denote this as homology? Yeah. And uh, to to answer your question is. This symplectic homology also comes with the filtration by the Hamiltonian actions of periodic orbits. And if you restrict to the, uh, to the sub complex of very small Hamiltonian actions, so that's roughly constant, so you're not seeing any non constant, you're only seeing the constant orbits, then this sequence becomes that one. In fact, it's the way that this grading by condescending indices work is that uh, somehow what, uh, what is homology in terms of condescending indices becomes then uh, a singular cohomology. Uh, yeah, because it goes to some more. Sort yes, of it goes to some more co chain complex. It's <laughs> just a matter of conventions. But mm -hmm. yes, yeah, it's simple. So. Right. Well, this was the second version of it. Now, the Oh, and I should give this one a name. This sometimes we call V-shaped symplectic homology, but uh, a more common name nowadays is Rabinovitz. The homology. It has many different definitions. This is one that has completely different definitions. So, yeah. so, which explains your name, Rabino. Uh, it comes from a different definition of this. All right, now, now, my third incarnation of this now exact sequence, and that will give a more satisfactory answer to your question of, of an example. This is the example that I will focus on in this talk. And this is related to the the yeah. definition of this that's intrinsic to the boundary that doesn't use the fact that delta v is the boundary or no, it does not. And in fact, uh, it's slightly misleading because this group, in fact, does depend on the interior. Although the generators don't, but you're counting some cylinders uh, satisfying a pseudo holomorphic curve equation, and those cylinders could travel through the interior. So so the differential would depend a priori on the interior, and there's examples where it actually does. Yeah, but but I think it's ju it's just nice to write it as something on the boundary, so the, the long exact looks like like the one in example one. It's different there. Yes. Yeah. Based on the Hamiltonian, you you make it still kernel that far away. Yes. Yes. Yes, it can. There is a map room for instance, which prohibits things to travel far out, but not far inside, even if you make it very big. Uh, it's just the way the science work. It's it's not prohibited, and mm -hmm. and we we have examples where it actually does depend on it, so it's hopeless to prove. Well, mm -hmm. and under some conditions, you can prove independence if you know some something about the indices. For instance, in this example from string topology that I'm about to discuss, if the dimension is big enough, I think dimension is at least four, it does not depend on the material. Mm -hmm. So it's a uh, yeah. In in interesting examples, it does. Um, so. So I, I take a manifold of uh, dimension n as in the, in the introduction, and uh, I take its unit disk cotangent bundle. So it's the uh, QP in the cotangent bundle. Q is the base vector, P is the vector in the fiber, such that the norm of P is let's say for two one with respect to again some Riemannian metric. Yeah, so it's the unit disk bundle in the cotangent bundle, um, and uh, its boundary. It's then what I will call S. Now it's the unit here bundle. Yeah, we're just for equality here. And there's a canonical one form lambda sum over pi e e e in local coordinates. Yeah, whoever took the course in mechanics has seen this canonical. And this, this is the canonical Leoville one form in, in classical mechanics. And that explains the name Leoville domain. That's where it's coming from because this is a, a Leoville form. Yeah. So, so this is the Leoville domain. <clears> 
And, uh, and so, so I can plug that into, into this uh, long exact sequence that we have, and that's the only example I will be concerned with. And here, now it relates to string topology. Namely, there's a theorem which was first uh, at least stated by Vita Bohm. And then there uh, was an effort of many people to make the proof completely uh, rigorous. Um, namely, the symplectic homology of this Liouville domain is canonically isomorphic to the loop space homology. So, so lambda is the loop space, the free loop space of M. So it just computes the loop space homology. Okay. Um, so, so you see here, this is my reason why I want to choose this grading. I want to call it homology because it really becomes the homology of loop space. So, so, so this, although some of the relation to singular homology is somewhat awkward because it goes to cohomology and so, but, but when you go to loop space homology, then it's completely natural and grading preserving. So, so that's what I want. So, so from that, I get now some long exact sequence uh, if I plug it in. And I want to plug it in the following way. You see, I, I don't, so, so this guy, now I have a nice, nice interpretation in terms of loop space homology. Well, this guy I don't, but I will just give it a name. Um, now, this, this guy, I still don't, but it has more to cohomology here. So, so this is loop space cohomology. So, so this guy I can also write in loop space terms. Yeah. So, so I want to basically look at the long exact sequence going that way. That's the one that I'd be interested in. So, so it goes from uh, loop space cohomology in degree minus star to loop space homology in degree star to some new player, which is, which, yeah, let me first write it. It's symplectic homology of the unit sphere bundle. And then it goes to one minus star loop space cohomology as it goes on. Yeah. And now, now this guy, I will just denote by H hat star of lambda, just to give it a new name. And we, we decided to call it Rabinovitz. Analogy. Actually, in a discussion yesterday, I learned we should have not given it any name, but can just come some with some really uh, unwieldy name and hope that somebody puts our name to it. Oh, now I want to talk about product structure. This, this has already some, some very attractive features. Namely, it we already have a product. Yeah, let me. Yeah, here there's. That's the loop product, and here, well, we have we have cohomology, and uh, 
Well, it's not modulo const, not relative to constant, but, but still somehow here, roughly speaking, we want to have the cohomology product. So the hope would be, can we put a product here, which is somehow uh, relating to both of these other ones? Yeah? And, and, and this, is, uh, this is true. So first of all, uh, symplectic homology of V and And also the symplectic homology of its boundary, they both carry natural products. They're both defined as some Fleur homologies, and they have the natural product counting through the holomorphic pairs of pens. So they carry natural yeah. pens. So I will draw them schematically like this, where these are inputs, two inputs, one output, and I will also denote those products by me. Yeah. Um, but the products, do they also have dependence on some symplectic area? Do they have some extra parameters? No, they don't. They don't. They they just depend on this Liouville domain. It's nothing, not, nothing else. Uh, nothing else. Yeah, so. So, so they, they have natural products, uh, which means that we do have a natural product here. Yeah? And, uh, and also, or maybe in this, in this sequence, we have a product here, we have a product here. Now, once we have a product here, you can ask that this map actually uh, relate the two products. This is a, a, an algebra map, and in fact, it is. So this is an algebra map. Yeah, so and this is an algebra map, which are so so this relates the I mean yeah, this is an algebra map here. Oh, well, there's actually two statements. First of all, abstractly, this is an algebra map. But now here there's an identification uh, identifying this with symplectic homology. So now I have a product of symplectic homology and I have a group product. And those actually also agree under under beta both isomorphism. So this here is also an algebra map. If you algebra homomorphism, if you put the pair of pen product here and the loop product there, yeah. So so everything falls nicely into place. So this is uh, this is about the the product. Now now about the the product here. Well, first of all, it doesn't live here, and also uh, um, I will not bring the code for that, which is possible. Uh, so for this. I want to enlarge this diagram slightly. Um, so let me redraw it here. So we have H star and star lambda going to H star lambda going to this new group. So you can infect put the relative homology into the picture. There's natural inclusions going this way, and you can put relative homology here. And there's natural inclusions. Sorry, no, no there's natural projections going this way. So, so this is, uh, yeah. A slightly enlarged uh, diagram. Now, what do we have? We have a we have the loop product here. We have the pants product here, and now we have the cohomology product, which actually lives here. Now, this is relative constant. So here we have this loop cohomology product, as studied by Goreski and Yeah, and now this map. It's an algebra map. Now it turns out this map is also an algebra map, which means that this this here really has as components somehow the, both the loop product and this other cohomology product. So, so both of them appear. It, it turns out I, I will come to that that this map is also almost injective. So so both so both of these and this and this are subrings in here. Yeah, they're not ideals, but they're subrings. Yeah. So this, this, yeah. Um, and now you can go further and also bring the co-product into 
Yeah. And I will not state any theorem. All those are things that need to be proven, but it turns out that this here also carries a natural co-product. So this is also true in general. Any convective homology of any Liouville domain carries a natural pair of pens co-product, lambda. And this is in fact defined as a secondary operation, literally. So this, this answers one question. So this is somehow a secondary uh, pair of pens co-product. Um, so there is a primary one, the naive one you write down and you prove that it vanishes and you get a secondary one, yes. So, so why does this relative co-origin go into H N? Um, oh, it's, uh, yeah, you need to do some diagram testing. It's not, uh, you mean this one, why, do you, why does it map into here? Yeah. Uh, you're writing uh, the, um, uh, I can explain you. I think I need to write a um, way more elaborate diagram, which then collapses onto this one. So, so you need to combine several long index sequences, one coming from uh, action filtration and and then you see that it. You know, that's a non trivial method. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in those two triangles, you, you, you have on the diagram, they are commuting. Yes, they're commuting. commuting. Those two diagrams commute. Uh, this sequence is exact, and this one is not. Hmm. Yes. Uh, the, the composition is zero here. Okay. Well, anyway, the, co the composition is zero, but it's not, it's not exact. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, Thomas, I, I will explain to you. I just need to... so you have a co-product lambda here. Now what do we have? Here we have also this uh co-product. That's exactly that's where it's defined. And this map intertwines co-products. So it's a co-algebra map. And now, of course, staring at this, there's something missing in this picture, right? I want to put a co-product here. Uh, what what co just to make the whole thing look symmetric. So what co-product could I put here? Well, this is cohomology. Now on homology, I have a product, and that that product gives me dually a co-product on cohomology. Yeah, so here I just take the the loop product and I dualize it. That is a co-product. Oh, I always my color coding. That should be a co-product. So I should write it in green, yeah. And then this is a this is a co-algebra map also. Okay. And now I'm nearing an end. So all right. Now we have solved uh, part of puzzle A. Well, we managed to put both of them onto the same space. It's a it's a new space. It's not a player that has appeared in uh, in homology group space. Yeah, it's a new kind of homology group space, which is combining homology and cones, mm -hmm. amalgamating them into a larger mm -hmm. space. And uh, and this carries a product and a co-product now on the same space. Now we put them on the same space. Now you can ask the question: What algebra do they define? And this took us really a long time to figure out. Um, and the answer in the end is very simple. And much more simple than we had expected. We had expected it to be some kind of infinitesimal algebra, and there's tons of versions of infinitesimal algebra in the in the literature, and we wrote in the literature and so on. Turns out, actually, it's an algebra that we all that we've known all along. So here's the theorem. The and this is true in general. If you take the symplectic model of any new domain, in particular, you take this Rabinovitz loop homology. Uh, with the product and the co-product. This uh, is a graded Robin is algebra Oh, I should to make it completely precise, I want to degree shift by half the dimension here. <clears throat> yes, so that uh, the maps somehow uh, have the correct parities. So it's a graded Frobenius algebra, meaning what? So, so what is the graded Frobenius algebra? It's a graded vector space. 
AA with the following structures. It should have a, a, a product which should be associative, a unital product, which I will draw like this. U and the unit is like this, and we know the unit by eta. Yeah. And then it should have a co associative, co unital, co product that we denote as lambda. And it has a co unit, say epsilon. And now, when you plug in the co unit in the output of the, the product, then you get a pairing. You do this. Yeah. I'm, I'm drawing it like it's it's a TQFT uh, structure, yeah. But you just let me plug in the the co, the co unit and the output of the product. This is a pairing, and you get also co pairing by doing similar things for the co product. You plug in the, the unit. Okay, they define isomorphisms uh, from A to its dual. So uh, P goes that way and C goes the other way, naturally. I mean, you, if you, you have a pairing, it gives you an isomorphism from A to its and and then there's there's further relations, namely uh, further relations that uh, if you uh, take the product and you apply now this uh, this co-pairing to it, then you get the co-product, and so on. Yeah. So so all of this looks like a TQFT, but the difference is that everything is graded. So the these operations have degrees. So, and the convention is such that after, after this shift, I, I put the product into degree zero, but the co-product lambda can have some degree. And in our case, it will actually have odd degree. So, so in our case, it will have degree one minus n. So it's odd. So, so the relations look like TQFT relations, but they all come with signs. Yeah. On the, but but other than that, it it looks like uh, like a TQFT, and and this uh, give the algebraic structure. This answers also the question of uh, that Sullivan asked about his relation. His relation is actually true, but it has an extra term in it, coming from the co-pairing here. Which in some examples, actually in the first example that we computed, it vanished. We were convinced that still Sullivan's relation true as he had written it. But in general, there's an extra term in it. Um, yeah, and, uh, and you can go further. You can bring the base loop space into the picture, uh, and then you get a, an open, closed TQFT, but everything in the graded sense, uh, which explains also a lot of relations between base and graded loops with your kind of and between those. Um, with that, uh, if I, I think my time is. Yeah. One minute. Or... One minute, yeah, okay. One minute is not enough. <laughs> to uh, compute an example. That's one thing I would have uh, done with more time. One can compute, one can work out uh, explicit examples. Basically, you can work out examples of spheres of productive spaces. And uh, so for some classes of manifolds, you can work out computing structure. The nice thing is once you start computing examples is that this algebraic structure is so rigid that you only need very little geometric input to, to determine the structure. Basically, you just need some little input about the loop product, and then the co-product is entirely de determined just in terms of the algebra. As you can imagine, once you know mu and you somehow uh, figure out what the, what the, the isomorphism to its dual, then somehow on the dual side, uh, you also get uh, the, the corresponding product. Yeah. So you get a proper duality isomorphism between A and then A dual. That's maybe the last thing that I, that I will state as a corollary, there is this E defines from A with mu and lambda defines an isomorphism to a dual with the dual operations but flipped. Yeah. That follows from the algebraic structure. 
which means that relating the, the product to the co-product. So once you know the product, you also know the co-product. Yes, you prove something about the product, you, you get it about the co-product. And this is what's answering puzzle two from the beginning, that we can explain all these dual pairs of results uh, that they are actually dual in this sense, they're related by this kind of duality. And we can come up with new symplectic proofs of a general statement in this Rabinovitz loop homology, which implies the classical one that were proved before by Nancy Hinkson and Marco Resnicki. No. And then I stop here, thank you. Those are the questions? Before you wrote, yeah, the SH of we didn't we identify with H of not? Um, no, SH is the homology. That's on, on some level domain. And, uh, if you take D, yes, D if you apply to a to a use to a contentious bundle, then you get, uh, get looks based on more, more general statements. This is more general statement, but it applies in particular to, to this uh, Rabinowitz loop homology. And in that case, can you make specific um, what's the relation of your product and whole product to the string whole product? And product is? I guess the product is the same as the string product. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Not defined, right? A priori. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yes. As part of the statement is you get an extension of the of the co-product, which was only defined relative to the constant loops. You get an extension to almost the whole homology. What you need, you can lambda extend. Uh, homology of lambda, and you don't need to model all the constants, but you need to model something. But you need to model the Euler characteristic of the base manifold times the point class. So, so it's it's almost like reduced homology if you would put it relative to a point, but but it, you don't need to model the point just Euler characteristic times point. For instance, if Euler characteristic is zero, you don't need to model anything, and then it extends just to the whole loop. Homology. So, one more. Is, is there a theory instead of embedding circles or instead of looking at loop spaces, of looking at figure eight or other uh, singular graphs embedded? You see, because the natural thing, uh, like you, you look for places where a loop self intersects. And then you cut it into two pieces, but it's more natural to look at it as in embedded figure eight. And that is being done, actually. Yes. So, so that uh, the, the space of figure eight into into the manifold uh, that is is one way to to define the loop product and co product on homologies, loop space homology and co homology. Um, by looking at this space and its neighborhood and, it, it, and, and its revolution into two loops and so on. And uh, this is what people study, but I haven't seen it being carried further as you suggest, yeah, to, to look at, at maps of more general graphs into the manifold and resonance. But certainly the space of maps of figure eight into M that features prominently in many works like Natalie. Yeah. So, so more questions or? <laughs> what is this duality in the case of the loop space? This is a map between the homology to and the cohomology. No, finally enough, it's not. Yeah? So uh, it's the map between the homology and the cohomology of this Rabinovitz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what does it? So it's, uh, so it's it maps Rabinovitz loop homology <laughs> to Rabinovitz loop cohomology. Now, now in Inside, no. yeah. So, so, so this is roughly speaking. It's not true. But in, in some examples, it's actually true. It's roughly speaking a direct sum of the homo of the loop space homology and the loop space cohomology. Sorry. Yeah. And uh, and likewise here. And this is doing this. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is this is not true always. There there's some error terms, here, but but they, they live only in the constant loop. So so rough, mostly this is this is true in this also. So it's not it's not uh, an isomorphism between loop space homology and loop space cohomology. Yeah, which which is better wouldn't because they are not isomorphic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Y
That, that also confused it for a while. How can that be? But uh, it, it, it can, yeah. Uh, so it's well known that uh, free loop is homology and it's expressed in terms of uh, options homology or homology in nice ways. Yeah, it's yes. certainly so. There, there's, there's been also a lot of work in that uh, direction. I should maybe mention a few names as uh, Manuel Rivera. I think it's probably the most relevant one, the joint paper with WAM. And then, uh, then there's also some work I think, by Ralph Kaufmann. And, and there are lots of others that uh, I, I should probably put at some point. Not in this context. <laughs> Never mind. So, uh, so yeah, there, there's been work uh, approaching the same question uh, from the Hochschild perspective. Mm -hmm. You start with Hochschild homology and so on, and we're we're in exchange with them. But it seems that uh, yeah, we are not detecting exactly the same kind of structures. And it's, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, ultimately, it should all be completely equivalent. But it's not entirely sorted out yet. I would say. But it's clearly there's a whole approach to this in terms of Hochschild mm homology. -hmm. Okay, so I guess we have to stop here and uh, so thank you again. <laughs>